Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 188 and today I'm joined on the podcast by Andrea, first team sports scientist at Chorley, along with a few other roles as well, which we'll go into. But thank you very much for coming on the podcast, mate. No, it's a pleasure, pleasure. Thanks to you for inviting me. No problem at all. We've just been saying that we've sort of done a switch in commutes, whereas you're in Manchester traveling to Chorley and, and other areas, which we'll discuss in a second. And I've sort of done the opposite. So and we must be passing on the motorway most days. Yeah, I, st- I should stay at yours and you should stay at mine sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <that's> pro- <laughs> that probably makes more sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, let's start with sort of traditional podcast fashion, but somewhere where I always like to start because it gives us a bit of background about yourself, just your background, previous roles, and then also a little bit of insight into what you currently do. Because I know I've briefly mentioned your role at Chile, but I know you've got some other stuff on as well. So do you want to take us through that to start with? Yeah, 100%. Uh, Right, I started my career when I was probably 15. I was playing uh, professional football back in Italy uh, in a league kind of League Two team compared to England. I played there since I was 18. Then I've been working a bit around Italy and then I moved to England five years ago. So I studied at uh, Manchester Metropolitan, got a degree in sports science, applied sports science and exercise. Uh, I'm just thinking to go into a master probably next year. From there, I had the chance to work with Oldham Athletic. So I was in charge of the strength and conditioning for the under-14, under-16 for just about one year. And then I had the opportunity to go and work with Chorley, which was quite funny how it went. Just I went there to work with the under-19, under-20, and there was was, uh, the sport sport side and the strength and conditioning coach. They was missing for the first team. So they were just like, do you want to stay? And I was like, yeah, of course, I'll do the session 100%. And the players really liked me. Coach really enjoyed it. Um, it was a really good session. And just like, right, do you want to stay with the first team? And I was like, right, that's perfect. And four months ago, well, th- two months ago, sorry, I started to work with Blackpool FC as well with the academy. So I'm working currently with the under 13, 14, uh, mainly gym based. So we don't do loads of session on the pitch. It's mainly gym based. What we do with Blackpool, while on the other side with Chorley, um, is a national league north type of team. So we are a part time. I know that you can you can see like teams around the league that are full time or part time or be of both. So what we what we try to do is try to give our best shot during the training session, which is I think it's been challenging in a way but it's been a great way to improve myself and try to use the time that we've been given during a cer- certain sessions. So try to really maximize the time that you've been given from the coaches to try to achieve what you've planned to achieve for that macro cycle or meso cycle, whatever you're working on. Brilliant. And what, what's your responsibility at Blackpool now? So what age is he, have you got at Blackpool? I've got the under 13, 14s. So I'm currently working with 13, 14. So it's, it's a bit of the opposite side from a first team to an academy type of perspective, because obviously we know from literature, especially when you work with youngest, uh, well, you've got two ways of treating them. So you can either take in consideration the, by the chronological age, which we almost know now that is wrong, or you can go and try to look at the biological age so what they try to do at Blackpool or what I used to do with my athletes as well is just try, try to work predictive height and peak height velocity. So try to understand on the spectrum of maturation where the athlete stands at the moment and try to work it from, from there. Obviously, we know that if the athlete is mature enough, is more prone to respond to some resistant training and some neural training. So like plyometric or um, um, proprioceptive type of work when they are not mature enough. So they are still getting into that peak height velocity. So they haven't reached that point yet. We try to work more on plyometric and sprinting. Just according to research, we know that their response is better. Obviously, if you want, I can get a bit more in detail on how we do 
you know, this type of calculation and how do we get there? Yeah, I think that'll be great actually to dive into in a second. But just before you do that, I was this conversation straight away leads me to a couple of questions that we've had on sure. previous podcasts, which I want to bring up for you because I think it'll be really good to get your insight on. But just initially before we do that, more career focus, like how is it managing two roles? Because obviously being across two clubs, but also across two first team and an academy, how, how are you finding that? Well, it's not easy because there's loads of time that is involved, especially with travelling. But I think is uh, at the moment with Blackpool, I'm working only two days, maybe one day sometimes. So I work alongside all the coaches, which sometimes I think is even more difficult because they are in charge of the programme. They speak with the coaches and you pretty much, you just need to put in practice what they want to do with certain athletes where with surely that I'm in charge, I can pretty much do a little bit. I've got a little bit more freedom so I can plan my micro cycle, get into meso cycle. I can adapt it according to results. I can do the type of testing that I want. So I've got straight contact almost every day with players and, you know, especially being part-time, one of the challenging, challenging, challenges is try to get the buy-in from the players. So especially I'm young, I'm really young. I know you, you are like some really monsters on, in the field on this podcast. I listen to your podcast. So I'm really young. I'm 26. I've got some players that they are actually older than me. So how do you get them to actually listen to you, make sure that you're telling them what to do and they're actually doing it? So that has been a bit of a challenge. And especially, you know, I use my barrier language a bit as a, as a joke <laughs> with them, as a joke with them. So they make jokes about me. I make jokes about them and their accents. So, and I think one of the most important things for me has been the knowledge of uh, playing football before. So why I've played football, I've been in that situation. I know what the player wants to do. I know that sometimes, as we were saying before, before the podcast started, sometimes we forgot about the human aspect that is behind the athlete. So they're not only athlete. So we need to remember that they've got a private life. They do something on the weekend. They might have a beer or two sometimes. Uh, they might want some free time as well. So it just try to understand when is the time to really push them and try to get them from behind and say, right, that is the time that you need to listen to everything I'm saying, no matter what. And then you might have some like period in the season when it's just like, right, okay, that's fine. If you need some more free time because you're tired, uh, especially because 90% of them, they work as well at the same time. So, you know, managing the load from be sitting for probably like eight, eight and a half hours and then coming straight to training. Sometimes I understand that it's not great because you're not a full-time athlete anymore. You haven't got uh, a chef that is cooking for you. You haven't got the facilities that you were expecting when you're coming from academies. Uh, it's just a completely different life for them as well. So managing between the two, coming back to your question, I just, I just went a, a bit far away. It just uh, really tried to take time to concentrate on what you need to work according to the age group but sometimes you'd be surprised our first team are actually really childish sometimes so like some of the exercise that you use for the under 13 14s are, are quite replicable for the for the first teams just because it's a way of getting them to you know to stimulate the athletes every time in order to respond to external cues or external stimuli so type of things that they need to think about so we know proprioception and you know all this type of training so I think it works alongside pretty well and just to flick you back into player mode a second so go back to your career as a player what was your perception of sports science and also what was your sort of requirement as a player and by that I mean like what did you maybe expect from a sports scientist yeah well, I played uh, probably eight years ago. So the image of the sports sciences, it was quite different, especially back in Italy. Uh, what I've seen in English football, we had a perception of the gym as a bad thing. 
So like going to the gym, it was seen as something that it was wrong just because, oh, you're just going to get bigger and therefore you're going to get slower. You don't need to squat, otherwise you'll be fatigued. I need the players fresh. So from my perspective, I had a really, really good um, strength and conditioning coach at the time. But uh, the academy system is, it was a bit different. So we weren't followed as the academy players are followed in here. So even like from a nutrition standpoint, we just had our nutrition from match day minus one at match day. So we don't have any type of, we didn't have any type of advice for the weekend, for the week, what do we need it to eat? When do we need it to eat? Uh, you know, like grams, how many grams do you need to eat? Now we know, uh, f you know, from research that it's good that you don't need more than two grams per kilo uh, body weight kilo uh, of protein in a day. Uh, you know that you need to eat five to seven uh, grams of carbohydrate per kilo after training in order to replenish that glycogen stores. So it just, this, uh, there was a completely different perspective and especially like knowledge wise, I think now performance has changed so much compared to where I was before. And I think that was one of the main reasons why I didn't make it to be fair. It just, I was, uh, I was a really good runner really good runner but I wasn't eating enough and now that I've got the knowledge I know that I wasn't eating enough but at the time I was just like I was young and I was full of energy and I was like why do I get injured why do I get fatigued why do I throw up after training and you know I'm the only one that is doing that and no one would say anything so my perspective of the sports scientists at the time was like right they're doing my best you know they're doing their best to get me in the position to perform at my best but now that I'm into the field, I know that it wasn't. So from one perspective, it's a shame. And, you know, from another point of view, it just pushed me to do not make the same mistake with my athlete. So even if I'm not a nutritionist, if I know something and I can give an advice, I always suggest go to a nutritionist because, you know, they are specialized to do these type of things. But if an athlete wants to know my opinion in respect on nutrition, I always try to help them. So I'll question them. What did you eat? When did you eat it? How many times are you eating? You know, these type of things. Try to get them to open up with you a little bit more and try to understand, again, the human aspect behind. So is it, is it fair to say then there's some similarities between going back eight years to when you were playing and the sort of perception of maybe what players thought and currently maybe what the parts maybe you've experienced that with some of the part-time players as well in that some of those maybe opinions of sports science and the support is similar or do you think it's come do you think it's come past that point uh it, it's really individual i think like it really depends from the players because especially the players they've got background in professional academy so we've got loads of players that came from premier league teams academy and their knowledge about you know nutrition uh, resistant training they know that it's really really important and they perform better when they do this type of training where we've got players that they always been maybe they've always been playing in the national league north so they've never been into a really really professional setup and they don't really understand how important it is or they understand that it's important but they don't know how uh they don't know the technique, for example, or sometimes why is a part-time team? I might give them a program, but I'm not there to let, you know, to push them to do the program. And we know the like uh, uh, sets, reps, how, how many minutes you rest is really, really important. So if I'm focusing on one specific quality and I'm telling them to rest for one minute, it has to be one minute. You know, you can go up to 130, but then if you start working over 130 you start to work on different type of physical abilities that is not what we're trying to do and why the player haven't got the knowledge to understand why rest is important they might not get the benefit of that specific training that you're trying to give them so they are reacting to the stimuli in a different different way so the players they have got more knowledge in the background they usually tend to respect you more because they understand the importance of the role, the importance of resistant training or strength training or speed training. Uh, so if, especially the one they've been injured in the past, they know that it's really, really important. 
So I yeah. think, yeah, from eight years to now, perspective has, has changed a lot, has changed. And I think as well as the demand, like, you know, there's loads more contacts, players need to be way stronger now, uh, distances have increased massively, especially in sprinting distances. So it's just like, you need to change as the demand of the sport change. And eight years ago, I'm sure that the demand were different and, and the science as well was different at the time. So you just need to be in line with the, with the new changes. I think the really interesting thing at that level as well is that you've just mentioned before that some clubs are full-time, some clubs are part-time. So you, you're treading that sort of line of players being in all the time or, like you say, having jobs and being part-time. But you'll know this better than me. Like, what do you see a big difference between not, not only leagues from things like distance covered and some of the stats that you're going to be monitoring, um, but also teams within the league? Are there differences from a, from a full-time club to a club like yours? Or is it not necessarily something that you've looked at? Uh, well, yeah, th there are differences, but what I found, there's not much difference in like distances or sprinting distances and even injury wise. I think we had two muscular injury during the season, so which is great. We had one mm -hmm. hamstring tear, great three from an athlete. They actually, uh, it was a recurrent injury, it happened already two times. And, you know, sometimes you need to make decision. I think the main difference between part time and full time obviously as, as he states in the world is the time that you have with them and usually the time is given from the money so from the budget that the club has got and when you are a full-time club usually you have got more players so when you've got more players it's easier to manage the players along you know the the season because this season we had two cups game and we played 46 games so for a club that is part time, which means you training three times, sorry, which means you training three times a week, is you know there's loads of game. Sometimes we were playing in 36 hours time. We had two games in 36 hours. How do you recover? Is you know how do you make them ready for that type of game? There's literally it's, you're supposed to recover, but you haven't got the facility or the time to let them recover. Uh, but I think the full time clubs most. Most of the time compared to us, they spend more time on analyzing. So like they have, you know, the day, maybe the day before the match or on match day, they've got their analysis room. They try to study the opponents, you know, what moment they should do, studying the uh, opposite players that they need to face during that day. And obviously they've got more time for the gym, which is something that we don't really have at times. And I think that has been one of the challenges with the player this this season. That everything that I was doing with them, it needed to be pitch based, which is a challenge in a way, but in in another way, is really productive for yourself because you need to think of different ways on how do you adapt training, just using whatever you've got. Sometimes you just need to use cones and bibs because we haven't got anything else. So I had some equipment myself so I can bring some weight or uh, some resistance band, uh, some parachute at time, which I don't think sometimes is really useful, but it's whatever you can get. How do you adapt your training to what you've got? While when you go into a professional setup like Blackpool, you, have, you pretty much have got everything. So it's different. You can plan the training session and you can just do the training session that you want because you don't need to think about how do you need to adapt it to what you have. So I think one is one of the biggest challenges and probably one of the biggest differences between players that play part-time or full-time. But again, it's, um, it's about you have, you have more time when you work in a full-time club, but it's always how do you use the time that you have. So I can have six, seven, eight hours, but if I don't know what to do with the players, it's pretty useless, especially if I don't have the buy-in of the players or even when I analyze data and match data or training data, if I don't know what those data means, it's pretty useless to analyze it because we know that from a GPS uh, you know, file, we've got probably about, 250, 260 data that we can try and analyze. So if I want to spend 
my whole day just trying to analyze it all the data is quite pointless at times. So I think, you know, you need to focus on something that you think is useful for you and then try to progress it, regress it, adapt it in training, try to replicate it according to the intensity or the volume that you want to get during that training session. So it's always about how you use your time, but distance wise, it's pretty similar between full time and part time. No, it's really interesting that, isn't it? Because obviously you're asking players to, the demands on the players are very similar. But like you say, the time is less. And not only is the time less in terms of the contact time you have, but then obviously they've got a lot of other stresses with jobs and things like that. And it's not only jobs a lot of time, is it? It's jobs that are unsociable hours. And I've known of players finishing games and going to work after night games or starting at ridiculous o'clock in the morning and making sure they're done for training sessions. So there's so many demands isn't it, that you're dealing with. One thing I was going to bring up, which I said before about one of the questions we've discussed before, especially in a part-time program like, like it is at Chorley, but I think any program, we, we've discussed big rocks. So we've discussed like the go-to things that you're going into that program and you're saying, right, I want to have this, this, and this in, in place. And th that's where I'm going to start. They're my big rocks. And whatever else comes after that, then I can sort of fill the gap on what I t whatever time I've got available. What were they for you? Well, well, when I started with Chorley, we were in September, so we were or already going into the season. But what I try to work mainly is literally pre-up and, you know, injury prevention. So... I was working on strength endurance, injury prevention, which is something that is quite easy to do on the pitch as well, because you don't need massive weights. You don't need massive amount of times as well. They are pretty easy exercise that you can use on the pitch. You can usually use it during the warm up, because sometimes that's all the time that we have. Because when you've got two hours training, the coaches just spend three days with them. They want to have some more time. So my main rock, rocks at the time, so my pillar was strength endurance, get them ready, pre-ab, injury prevention type of work. And then I tried to progress it into more uh, ballistic plyometric training, which is something that I could easily do with them. At times, it depends about the players. Sometimes I was calling the players that most needed it to get them into the gym. So sometimes I was taking the players with me into the gym and we were doing some specific programs with them to make sure, especially the one that had previous history of injuries, hamstring injuries, uh, you know, something that it can take you off the pitch for a really long time. And that's where I try to work more on an individualized base. Or also, obviously, we do our testing. So from the testing, which I probably did in October at the time, I try to group players. So if I know that players need to be stimulated more from an anaerobic perspective, and is a really, really good aerobic, sorry, aerobic perspective. So if he's a really good runner and he can cover, easily can cover a good amount of distance during a game, I might need to work with him on sprinting because that repetitive sprint ability is not good enough compared to the stats of the other players. While I've got other athletes that they can sprint all day, but they can't run. So they can't constantly run for 90 minutes. So these two groups, I, I try to split them up and I try to work with the players the more most needed, a more volume type of workout or a more intense type of workout according to what they actually need. But again, one of the challenges has been around strength because when you haven't got access to a gym, it's really difficult to get that overload that when you're actually working on strength, we know that you're working on 90, 95%, 85 sometimes, but if you haven't got a gym, it's quite impossible to get that stimuli out on the players. So when I know that I needed to do it with the player, I would just write, that's the moment when you, we need to work on this. I'll give you the, the specific program for you. Just keep working on to it. And I was discussing it with one uh, of my professor at uni as well, probably a couple of days ago. That sometimes we think about uh, mesocycle in, in a wrong way, like usually we know a mesa cycle can be four or six weeks, but especially with youngest maybe, but while we've got players that are 18, 19, and maybe they haven't been working on strength before, if we see that during that four or six weeks, we have a good progression. So 
obviously we take the smallest worthwhile change as a type of range. So how much difference between the first test and the second test we think is important and is relevant as an improvement. So it's classified as an improvement. And if we see that this improvement is still possible, so there's still a window of improvement, why do I need to stop? Mm. So if I've seen that after four or five weeks that I've, I've finished my menstrual cycle with them and I can, I can see that they're still improving, so they're still going up, maybe for power, power production or rate of force development, why do I need to stop? You know, even though my program said, my, my micro cycle said, right, in six weeks, that's, that's it, it's finished. But if I know the power is really important for that players, or I don't know, I'm working on impulse for certain types of players, why do I need to stop? So I can keep going and just try to adapt my program according to the progress that, you know, the players are, are, are receiving. Because every player is different, so the response from the player might be different. So if I see that with the player is working and it's still improving, so the window of improvement is, is massive, I, I'll be like, right, okay, let's just stay there. But let's not work on strength speed, for example. They might be the next one. Let's just keep it in, on strength. So maximum strength, pure strength. And let's see if we can get some more improvement for another week or two weeks. Although my program beforehand was just, right, we need to finish it. Yeah, there has to be that flexibility there, doesn't it? And that, in a way, is what we touched on a couple of episodes ago, is that your, your training is monitoring, isn't it? Like you're constantly monitoring your players session in, session out. And that's exactly what you're referring to. You're not, you're not having a rigid program where it's like a, a specific start and stop, which you might set out initially. But we say about planning in pencil, don't we, rather than pen? Like you yeah. want to be able to adapt things. Um, if I was to ask the same question about these big, big rocks or pillars or whatever we want to refer to them as, but now with the Blackpool role in the academy, how would that differ or what would that look like? Right, that's completely different, I think. Um, we, come, we come back from you know, what I was saying at the start. So taking from a biological age perspective. So once I know how far away they are from peak height velocity, I can understand uh, the structure of the bones, the architecture of the muscles as well. So we know that they are more prone to receive certain type of stimuli. But in my perspective, um, I think it's more important to work on movement. So how do you move? Can you skip? Can you jump? Can you land? So like all try to build the foundation on specific movement to then try and build it up with time and try to really create that good athlete away from football. So it doesn't necessarily need to be specific for that specific player but we're just trying to build a really good athlete that he can move in all different planes of movement he can change direction he knows the technique of changing direction he knows the technique of acceleration he knows how to decelerate he knows what's the position of the foot when it's going top speed so try to work on this specific skill especially seeing my first team players and that's a good thing I think when you've got something to relate it to I've got a really, really bad technique players when they run sometimes. They're still really quick. Doesn't mean that you're not quick, but the technique is wrong. And you can tell that it's wrong. So some of them are not getting really into that triple extension. They've got a massive recovery of the foot when they're going from one foot to another, someone from one stride to another, someone is overstriding, someone is heel kicking, which is a really footballer thing that for some reason... 90% of footballers just see a kick when they're running. And we know from research that you're putting loads of pressure onto your muscles, so like hip flexor, rectus femoris, hamstring as well, when you don't really need it during, during that action. So when you're doing a certain movement, it needs to be um, concrete to what your aim is. So we try to avoid, I try to work myself, avoiding false steps which again is another thing that loads of footballers do. So when I'm starting, I, they usually take a step back, backwards to progress and to propel themselves forward. But if you think about it, you're losing probably 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 4, 5 milliseconds. They might not get you there. 
So when I want, when I usually say to them as well, if you want to go forward, you need to go forward. So first step is forward. I don't need to go backwards to propel myself forward. So we try to work on mechanics, mechanics of movement, different type of movement. How do you react to an external stimuli? How do you shift your body weight when you change direction? Uh, and then obviously we build the foundation as well for in gym programs as we progress. So how do you squat? How do you, can you do an overhead squat? Progress it into some weightlifting derivatives as well. As obviously now we know that there's loads of research going out uh, um, on weightlifting derivatives and important on the force velocity spectrum. So just making sure that when they go into the gym and they are putting on the big weights, they know what they're doing. So you don't need to start from zero with them. But my personal opinion is just try to make them a good athlete. So can they run? Can they jump? Can they change direction? Can they land? It gives a really nice insight, I think, for the balance that you've got between roles in terms of first team and an academy, but also the, the part-time, full-time. Like for me, the sort of blend that you're working with at the moment gives, gives you as a practitioner such a good insight um, into well, I was going to say two worlds, but essentially it's like four worlds with full-time, part-time and, and different age groups. And it, and it sounds, it's great to get that insight from you on these questions. The, the other thing I was going to ask and just try and dive into the part-time stuff a little bit more, because I think there'd be people that can relate to this really well, is you mentioned before about buying and getting play, keeping players on track. What maybe, because we've talked about that as like a challenge, one of the main challenges of part-time players going off and obviously having other commitments and things like that. What are maybe some things that you've put in place that have um, helped with that and maybe given them the support away from the club where full-time players will be in the club doing that work? Well, I think, uh, well, one of the main things is usually the relationship that you build with the players. So again, that won't relate to the buy-in of the players, but they need to believe that what you're trying to do with them is going to make them better. Especially when you work in part-time club, what I usually tend to say to my players, um, we have got probably seven or eight players that they have played professional and they're still 21, 22, 24. What I always say to them, you're still in time to make it. So if you want to make it, you need to make sure that you're doing what a full-time athlete is doing. So what I'm trying to do now is providing you with something that you can help you keep track with what they are doing in a full-time club. So in a full-time environment, they go to the gym two or three times a week. They eat well, they respect their recovery, you know, they rest well, they sleep well. So what I'm trying to do with you, I just want you to believe that you can still be a player. And that's why you need to work on these type of things. Again, if you don't want to do it, I'm not forcing you because no one likes to be forced. So I'm not saying that you need to do it or you have to do it. But if I was you and I had, you know, your, I don't know, your technical abilities or your running speed or the way how you finish, I would do it because it's a, it's a waste. Like, you know, there's, a, there's a still a talent in you that they can express themselves. And we know the players, some players have started their career when they were 24, 25 or even 26. Just because you get a, a type of maturation that it just afterwards on, in your time life. So you start to realize, right, I, I wasn't a great athlete. I wasn't doing very much to respect myself, to respect my body. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't sleeping right. I was going out every night. But now I know. So you still have got that technical ability. It's just the mindset that is different. So I think one of the important things in, in part-time, just to answer your question, is just try to build a mindset in the players and make them believe that what you try to do with them is just to get them better. So what I usually tend to say, probably, I'm sorry for all the Chorley listener, if there's going to be some, but I tend to say, I don't, want you, I don't want you to sit in here next year. I want you to be somewhere else because that's my aim. If one of my players goes up, that means that I've done a good job because I've worked with you. You've worked well as well because I'm just providing you with something. Then mm -hmm. it's up to you. How do you keep the intent? So how do you, do you get that stimuli right? Because we know that players sometimes, there's a, a great 
um, I think it was um, it was a presentation from Des Ryan. That is one of the, um, is the performance director of Arsenal Academy, and it was great. It was just showing a video of a um, an Arsenal player. They, he was doing a drop jump, and you could tell from his face that he couldn't care less about what he was doing. So you know that during that time he's not learning anything because he's not concentrating on what he's doing. The intent is not maximal as you wanted it to be. So from my perspective, how do you get the players to buy in into that specific exercise? So even like a drop jump, some of the players, they don't understand what he's related to. So I try to explain why do we do drop jumps or why do we do box jumps so that they can try and relate and think about it and say, Right, okay, it does make sense. So that's my perspective with part time. Again, it's, it's about understanding them as a person and try to really get inside to get to know them and try to stimulate them more and more and more. Even if you don't think they're going to make it as a footballer, honestly, N- not all the 20 players that we've got are going to make it, but maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. It's probably, I think, my personal opinion is in the mindset. No, brilliant. Yeah, and that, that's that's a really, really good insight. I think for a lot of lot of listeners, um, I think we've covered some really, really good stuff there. I want to just move on to the questions that we finish each podcast with. And I think these would be get, good to get your perspective on these. And the first one I always ask is, who have been some of the biggest influences on your career so far? Your short career so far, I should add. <laughs> Yeah, sure, Curry, exactly. No, is I've got one of my favorite uh, strength and conditioning coach is uh, Oscar Ortega. That is the first team uh, strength and conditioning coach of Atletico Madrid. Uh, I really like his type of training. He's one of the person that is, is really pitch-based. He tries to get some specificity from his type of training. He tries always to involve the ball as well. But one of the main things that I love from him is the way how the players respect him. So every time when there's the warm-up before the game, they stop after the warm-up, they come all inside. He just says a couple of words to them to fire them up, to get them ready to go. And you can really see the players that are really buying into him. And that's one of the things that I, I really like because at the end of the day, yes, we are sports scientists. We work with science, but we're still coaching. So the psych- psychological aspect is still really, really important. What can you transmit? to the players and another one quick one it was one of my professors that used to work with Liverpool uh, at the time which is Julian Monk and now he's teaching at uh, use in Manchester is one that is the one that when I was a student I was really interested about his lesson and what he was doing and you know the way how he worked with players he was working in football and rugby cricket he's got massive background so I really need to say thanks to him Brilliant. And then what would you say your biggest strength is as a practitioner? Well, one of the things that I always say is I speak three languages. So I speak Italian, English and and Spanish. And I think that's one of my main strengths, just purely because nowadays we've got footballers from loads of different backgrounds. Most of the time when they come to England, they don't know how to speak English, especially if they are South American. So sometimes the way how you can communicate with them is a way to get them to buy in because you can explain yourself. You can, you know, put them on the side and say, right, that's how you need to do it. That's what you need to do. And that's why you need to do it. When sometimes when you just demonstrate it with a, with a demonstration of an exercise, they'll be like, right, why am I doing this? I don't really understand it. Or when you need to be technical about some techniques, especially in lifting or weightlifting them most of the time in South America, is not a common technique and you need to let them learn. I think try to speak their main language is really, really important thing. And another thing is I'm really young, as you said, I've got probably three years in, you know, in my career, but it's just keep learning every time. So this year, probably I read about six books so far. So it's the, as, as the name says, is a science. So the science is always evolving. So every day we can see that there's a new research. It, you know, there's a new uh, way of training. There's an, you know, now, for example, we know um, velocity-based training is a massive, massive um, new come out 
in aspect of training and how, how do you work around reps and intensity and volume. So it just try to learn every time from different things, from different books, different perspectives, but always try to keep, uh, you know, your criticism up. Just do not read the research, maybe read the title or like squat improves sprinting distance. And you'll be like, right, perfect. Squat improves, the, you know, sprinting distance. I always try to ask why. There's one of the famous philosophers, the Socrates, he always said TST, which means what is it? So everything that you were saying, they were asking, and, and what is it? So why is improving performance? Or just because of this, this, all right, why was the, is increasing the cross-sectional area, right? Perfect, why? So try to dig deep and deep and deep and deep and try to get always more answer, more answer. And as you get more answer, your knowledge improved as well. Brilliant. I did think when you said I speak three languages, you were going to go English, Italian, and Chorley. <laughs> so that's four then. Yeah. I'd go with four then. That's not English. <laughs> sure. but, mate, brilliant. Um, just before we go into the final one, you just mentioned about books. Can you give us a book recommendation? Well, Put you on the, the spot. Yeah, 100%, 100%. At the moment, uh, I've been reading uh, Football Conditioning from Adam Owen, uh, PhD. It's a great book, just because sometimes we focus on the strength side. That's another thing that I probably didn't mention. So sometimes we tend to focus too much on the strength side and, you know, be the guy that's in the gym all the time. And then we don't know what to do when we are on the pitch. And as my role at Shirley is mainly on the pitch. I wanted to know more. So how do I periodize the small side games? How do I increase the intensity volume? How do I work around it during the week? Uh, and these type of things. And that's, that's a great book. And there's another one that I'm currently reading. I finished up one day. It's the one from Paul Comfort at Turner, which is the last edition of Advanced Strength and Conditioning, which is great. There's loads of research, goes all the way around from resistant training to plyometric. It's, it's really great. It's worth a buy. Brilliant. You might have answered this question already with some of this stuff, but I always ask as well, what's your approach to CPD? So continue learning. Everyone has a slightly different approach, whether it's listening to podcasts, reading articles, reading research, reading books, a bit of a combination or conversations. What's your approach? How do, how do you improve on a daily basis? Well, my traveling actually has been a really, really good tool for me because while I'm driving for hours, pretty much every day, one hour to go, one hour to come back. I always try to put some podcast on. So whether it's your podcast, I try to listen to experts, what they say, why they're saying it. I try to find the, you know, the, the topic that I want to focus on and just put it into the car. So I really like listening when I'm driving, just because otherwise for me, it's a waste of time. It's an hour wasted when I'm not doing anything, driving for an hour. And you know I can do two things at the, at, at the same time. So 100% listening. I think it's really personal as well. I write reading. I really like physics as well. So I really try to get into biomechanics, you know, all the physics aspects that is behind of sports scientists. But CPD is, is really important, as probably I mentioned before. It is a science and science is in constant change. So we need to be ready and adapt with the change. So make sure that we know what's coming next, especially you know, in my personal case, when I want to progress and I want to go in a professional club as a full-time job, hopefully in the future. I just wanted to make sure that if someone asks me something about latest research, I don't know, like eccentric training again, or uh, velocity-based training, I know what I'm talking about. And then doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that I need to buy it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that because you're reading, oh, everyone is doing velocity-based training. I need to do it. It doesn't mean that. It just try to find your philosophy and try to understand it. Do you think it actually works with what you do? So if it's a yes, I'll dig it. I'll dig a little bit more deep and I'll try to find, find out a little bit more about it. If it's something that I'm not really interested, I still listen to it because it's just good to know. So I know and... I, if someone asks ask me, so what's your idea? I can tell why I don't use it. Because that's the question, you know, I'm not right. Some other sports scientist is not right. No one is right. Or we all, well, we all right. No one is wrong. It's just as long as you can give an explanation to what you're doing 
and there's a scientific reason for what you're doing doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong and I'm right. It's just yeah. the approach that is different, just the philosophy that is different. So just try to build your philosophy, reading everything, books, podcasts, research. You know, we got access to everything nowadays. Google Scholar, massive. Just try to look up whatever you want. You've got thousands and thousands of research. UK SCA, NSCA from, you know, America. It's just a membership. And you've got thousands of research, presentation, post-presentation, exercise demonstration. There's everything on it. Brilliant, mate. This has been fascinating. Really, really cool conversation. I've loved it. Um, like I say, the blend you've got going on at the moment with the two roles is really, really interesting. So I hope, hope people have been able to take plenty from that. I always say to finish off, to give your contacts, so whether that's social media, whatever you want to give, if people have got questions or they want to just reach out and have a conversation, where would you direct them to go? I, I use a lot my LinkedIn profile. So just look up for Andrea Spagnolo as it'll probably come up afterwards. Just look up for my name, you know, drop me a message, whatever type of questions you want me to ask. Or if you want to share some data or some opinion with me, I'm always, always, always open. Super, mate. Well, obviously we've just finished, finished the season now. So enjoy a little bit of time Thanks, off. Thanks, mate. I hope yeah, you get it's a, a good day today off. as well. It is. It's lovely, yeah. isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Enjoy and all the best for next season. And we'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, keep keep up the good work. Thanks a lot, mate. Really appreciate being in here. Thanks a lot for giving you your time. It's been really, really a pleasure.